Okay, it is 5.03, so I think we're going to start off now. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to our final industry series for today. I don't know, for this semester, sorry. Um, as I mentioned before, please turn your cameras on if you can, just because it'd be really wonderful to see everyone's faces. Um, if you have any questions throughout the talk or things you're curious about, please pop them in the chat. We love reading them and we'll hopefully get to them at the end of the talk. I'm going to hand things over to Olivia, who's going to run by things and also introduce our reps for today. So take it away, Olivia. All right. Thanks, Sophia. So um, welcome to the last of our four interviews for the Industry Talk series. Um, make sure to feed it, uh, fill out the quick feedback form that we'll post at the end um, to ensure that you see those 10 engineering pep hours. Um, and like Sophia said, if you have any questions throughout the interview, please send them in the chat um, and we recommend that you take some notes down. Um, so yeah, if everyone could turn on their cameras, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, so I'll just in, uh, introduce our interviewees. So we have Alison Mirrors. Uh, she is the Chief Executive Director of Roberts Co. Um, she has more than 20 years experience in the construction, construction sector and has a strong commercial expertise matched with significant site experience. So welcome, Alison. Um, and our second interviewee is Matthew Bourne. Matt is the General Managing Building New South Wales and ACT at John Holland, and he has over 25 years experience within the construction industry, particularly with ma majoring projects and in associate, associate director roles. Um, so I'll just give a quick introduction to both the companies. Um, so Roberts Co, uh, Alison Miriam's company, is a boutique tier one construction company. Um, their main purpose is to have a positive change in the construction, Australian construction industry. The firm currently operates within the Sydney market with eight active projects across the public and private sector. Uh, and then John Holland is a 70 year old construction company, which operates in Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand and Southeast Asia providing infrastructure and property development to the rail and building industry. So welcome to the both of you. Um, just a beginning question is, so you're both uh, UTS graduates. I was wondering if you could please tell me a little bit about your background and education. Um, maybe starting with Matt. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, look, I started as my first construction management degree at UTS in 95. Um, I actually entered the construction industry in 94, so showing my age a little bit. Uh, but I grew up in Wollongong um, and um, managed to get a job with a builder that was building a big temple across the hill from where I lived, basically, um, which I can go on about if I need to. But uh, Started there in construction management and um, was actually with another company for nearly 25 years uh, before moving across a number of years ago to John Holland. So um, been in building my whole life, um, moving up through the ranks and basically in the Sydney region and then um, now at John Holland. Um, and obviously recently, uh, a few years ago, just completed another degree in um, a global executive MBA with University of Sydney, uh, which, was, which was great. So it's a very short wrap. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, I just had a quick question. What were the advantages about getting your MBA? Yeah, look, that uh, came at a point where um, I think one of the lessons is to pass on everyone is to continue to challenge yourself and to make sure you're out of your depth. Um, I got to a point where I think I was probably too comfortable in what I was doing and needed um, a change. And so companies with at the time supported me to to get into, um, do a different degree, completely nothing to do with construction and, and to get exposure. And so um, to get exposure outside of what you're doing from different companies, from different places is the best thing you can ever do and, and to hear from different people and get that greater diversity. So I basically threw myself in the deep end and, and did that. And it was the best thing I've ever done. Uh, because really what you end up doing when you get to a point is you're running a business. You're not sort of building or anything. You're really running a business and every project's a business of everything you do. So um, that's how I got into it. Yeah, yeah that's really cool. Uh, glad to hear you came to the dark side at USIT as well. Yeah, um, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the similar question for Alison. Um, yeah, if you could just tell us a bit about your background and education, please. 
Yeah, I um I have a Bachelor of Building in Construction Economics. So um, it was when I started out a quantity surveying degree. Uh, I studied that. Uh, I am older than Matt. I, I completed in 95 when Matt started. Uh, because most people did the degree six years part-time and I did it um, two years part-time, two years full-time. I came out young. So I kept studying and I did a graduate diploma in urban estate management, which is really a property development degree. Uh, I then went on to do all the subjects of a master's of land economics, but I couldn't be asked writing the thesis. So I, I pulled out and um, I really did that because I wanted to learn as much as I could. And I knew once I stopped studying, I'd never go back again. Um, I take my hat off to Matt going back to do an MBA because it's really hard later in life. Um, I worked for a quantity surveying firm initially. I then went to Multiplex for 16 years. Uh, I then went, I had maternity leave. I've got an eight-year-old son. I then went to um, Lendlease for three years and then five years ago moved to Roberts, uh, Roberts Co, uh, which was Roberts Pizzerotti. Uh, but I worked my way up. I spent eight years on sites. And I really came up through contracts admin, contracts manager, commercial manager, regional commercial manager, director, and then moved into the GM and CEO roles. Yeah, well, that's really cool. Um, and a question about how you both initially got into the industry, because I know a lot of um, the attendees today are trying to sort of work their way into it. Um, and it's a bit scary and stuff. So yeah, how did you, what was like the first role that sort of gave you a bit of experience? Uh, um, again, you, yeah, maybe for Matt. <laughs> um, yeah, look, um, mine started with a big yellow book called the Yellow Pages that probably you, a lot of you don't know. Um, true story, yeah, I actually applied to be in construction economics at UTS when I used to run that house and then uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. I'll be honest with you. I was in year 12. I, I liked business. I was really good at maths, but I, I'm more of a, a street sort of smart person. I like to be more pragmatic than, um, you yeah, know, than the, I suppose the opposite of that. So I, I looked at doing construction economics degree. It was actually by chance at a careers fair. I ran into someone that looked like no one was speaking to them all day. So I went and spoke to them and it was about construction economics, true story. And then I applied and then I looked up the yellow pages and applied, wrote letters sending my CV to 50 different companies and ended up getting a, a cadetship with a company that was building a temple across the road from my house down in Wollongong, which you might see on the southern side of Wollongong. So I actually started it really by accident, not knowing what I was doing. And then I, I went to the interview. They said, what's this construction economics? We don't know what that is. We want you to do construction management. And I said, okay. I, I didn't even know. You know, <laughs> don't know at that stage. You sort of know, but you don't really, you know. And um, and then um, started on site as a, and, and I basically took time off to do my HSC because I was starting as a like a, a site clerk. It was, that was a job back then, a bit of a different time, um, thrown you know, on site and then um, got to keep my job if I got into uni. And I got into uni, then moved to Sydney and lived in student residence and had all that fun time. But I did six years part-time, start to finish. Um, yeah, so starting up that way. Yeah, well, that's a really good, good experience. Um, and what about you, Alison? Um, my grandfather was a QS and he died before I was born. But the way he raised my father was to say, look at that building, look at that crane, look at the materials. Uh, Dad was a civil engineer, a uh, marine engineer um, and fitted and turner by trade, marine engineer. So Dad was in ships and if Dad was sailing on weekends on cargo carriers, I'd sail with him up and down the east coast of Australia. And he raised my sister and I the same way. And so my sister is a civil engineer and I'm a builder. Uh, and in Dad's eulogy, Mum said in many respects, John got two sons and she got two daughters. I went to an all-girls school and I was taught that girls could do anything. And it wasn't until the first day of uni when I looked around and I'm like, where are all the girls? Uh, and realised I might have a hard time. Uh, you know, I hadn't really appreciated that it would be so masculine. I'm not sure why. If I thought about it, it would be logical. Um, so I worked, as I said, in a QS company, and that company is now um, actually the company you know as Architect, it's the Architects. Uh, they have a QS division there, and, and I went to a project management company for 12 months, a client side, and then they retrenched me and they said, you need to work for Multiplex, and we've spoken to them, and you should go and work for them. And I said, I, I just, I don't want to work for a builder. Uh, and the first interview I had at Multiplex, I failed. 
because I said to them, I water ski, um, you know, I've been water skiing since I was eight. It's what we do with my family every Saturday. I'll work any hours of the day and night, Monday to Friday. I don't do weekends. And so I failed. Um, and they rang me up and said, oh, we want you to go to one more interview. And I went to the next interview and I thought, well, I just won't tell them that I'm not going to um, work Saturdays and I'll just get the job and I'll deal with it later. And that's what I did. Um, a question in the chat's just come in, what is contracts management? It is uh, when you're on site, it's anything to do with the money of the site. So if Matt's my project manager and he says, I need a, a bricklayer, I would put the packages together. I'd put all the drawings together. I'd write the scope of work for what the bricklayer had to do on site, send out the tender packages, get the pricing in, work out um, who the best quote was from, best value for money, put it together, make the recommendation to head office to sign up that subcontract to put the contract together and then pay them and do all the cost reporting through the job, kind of be like the, con be like the lawyer, the financial controller um, and do all the administration on the site. Um, Matt, would that be a fair description? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I just want to talk about the two companies for a little bit. So we'll start with John Holland. Um, so what are the company's main purpose and objectives? Yeah, so it's a good question. I'll try and avoid um, the company lines and just tell you straight at every one. So I'm talking from what it means to me. So look, as you said at the start, John Holland, the company name has been around for 70 odd years. Um, I used to compete against John Holland. I actually respected the brand, um, but actually found it quite easy to compete against them. Um, and um, so what happened a, a few years ago, they restructured the business um, under some new, uh, under the new ownership and, and created a dedicated building unit. Um, so that's what I've come across to be part of. Um, and I can tell you the purpose is sustainable growth and profitable growth. Um, there's a lot of other purposes which I'll you know, we'll probably get to with questions about people and staff and sustainability and so forth and our social impact, which is incredibly important, but um, underlying, you know, um, to create sustainable growth and not be silly about it. Um, and that reset with everything happening in the, the infrastructure world today is an absolute priority. Yeah, um, and we'll definitely touch on some of those topics a bit later on. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and Roberts Co. So, Alison, can you explain a little bit more about um, your company? Um, and also, if you could touch on so how Roberts Co. bought out the Pizzarotti side uh, recently at the beginning of the year. Um, and so, for the audience, if they don't know, it's now a completely Australian owned construction company. Um, so, yeah, if you could also explain a little bit about why that happens, that would be good. Yeah. So, uh, September 2016, Andrew Roberts approached me. Andrew Roberts is the son of the founder of Multiplex uh, and said, we're going to start again and we want you to come and run it. I'm going to give you a blank sheet of paper and I'm going to give you a whole lot of cash. Create the best construction company you can. And so when you're given a blank sheet of paper 25 years into your career or 20 years into your career, you want to make the most of it. And we have a very unsustainable industry at the moment in that we have very high presentees and we have high divorce rates, we have high suicide rates. Uh, we are only 18%, 18.1% female and only 13% uh, female managers on sites. When I look at all those things, I can't change those statistics, but I can influence them by how we behave. And so we said, we wanna be a catalyst for positive change in the construction industry. And if we didn't try and make the most of the blank sheet of paper, it would be an enormous waste. And I think a lot of companies struggle to be able to make the change um, to be more sustainable businesses. And I don't mean sustainability in terms of environment. I mean, um, the company, the longevity of the company and the industry, uh, because there's so many things you need to do at the same time. And with a blank sheet of paper, Olivia, we have tried to fix a whole lot of that. Uh, in, I don't know, I think it was February this year, we announced that the Pizzarotti side of the business had been bought out by Andrew Roberts, Roberts Co. We are now 100% Australian owned. I didn't realise how patriotic we are as a society and how happy everyone was that we were Australian owned. I was worried about it, uh, but I shouldn't have been. Uh, the Pizzarotti side of the family uh, really were an infrastructure business and they wanted to do roads, rail, tunnels, 
that sort of thing. And the risk profile in that side of the industry is so horrific that if you get it wrong, I would have blown up the balance sheet. You know, you, you, you don't have to go far to read um, West Connects lost money, North Connects lost money, um, the Gateway in Brisbane lost money. And it's not $10 million, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. So we said, look, we don't wanna go into that space. And quite interestingly in Italy, the risk profile when they do a tunnel, they have a risk profile for type A, type B, type C, type D, geotechnical conditions, and they have different prices. And depending on what they find in the ground is what their price is. And it might cost them $600,000 to put a tender in, whereas here it might cost $20 million to put a tender in. Um, and so when we explained all that to them, they went, oh no, 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 we don't wanna do that. Uh, and so we said, we'll buy you out. Uh, and so they're very happy with it. Uh, all of our clients are happy that we're Australian owned. Um, so yeah, that's it's been a good process. Um, yeah, it's been very impressive what the company's done um, in such little time and the growth. So yeah, very commendable. Um, so the next question. Um, so for Roberts Co, how did this change influence the engineering department specifically? What do you mean by engineering department? Um, like more the construction um, engineers, like project managements and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so there are five key pillars of how the business operates. The first one is I want the right clients. If I don't get the right clients, they figuratively kill your people. People are the only asset we've got as an organisation. We don't own cranes or hoists or anything. So I want to work for the right clients. I want the right people. So we've been really, we do have the Paul Roos no dickheads policy. Um, we want to make sure we've got the best people. Then what we did was invest a lot of time in getting the right design managers. And what you'll see on construction projects is that the project starts really well and it's, you know, it's ticking along nicely, but the back end of the job, you're suddenly working six and seven days a week and there's this real crunch to get to completion. My theory is that the root cause of that is that you haven't resolved design up front. And so we've said, let's invest in getting awesome design managers and they are civil engineers, services engineers, mechanical, electrical, they're architects. And we manage the design that the external consultants do. And so when we're digging the hole, we need the concrete set out drawings, we need the pile locations, we don't need the paint colors and the carpet finishes. Um, then we said, let's invest a whole lot of time and effort in tech. And then let's make sure we can make our supply chain that it's really easy to work with us. So what we're trying to do is get our foremen and engineers to use their brains where they're best trained, and that is to solve construction problems. So we're trying to take a whole lot of process away by getting the right people with the right clients at the right point in time, that they don't focus on process, they focus on construction problems. Um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger answer than all of that, but that is what we're trying to do to get our people away from computers and back out on site building and solving construction problems. Yeah, yeah. it seems to be a difficult process, but you're doing well. Um, so just, I'll go over to Matt now. Um, how does you, uh, John Holland ensure sustainable practices? I think um, sustainability is a topic is a very large topic to go into. Um, so look, the company has, it does, we do have like four pillars of sustainability, but I just wanted to talk about what, you know, what, what I'm focusing on, what we focus on, what it means to our employees. Because um, like Alison's dead right, it's all about the people and the people is everything. Um, I found, um, a, you know, a big change in that coming from a, a family owned company to a much larger T1, um, quite a, a challenge in the people management. So that's what we've tried to reset in the last three years that I've been here. Uh, but the, look, the two big things that we, while well, we focus on all the pillars, which I'm not going to go through, but the, the two large ones we focus on is really about the people and the empowerment of the people. And that's, it goes back to, you know, our, our, um, our apprenticeship programs and, and also, you know, what we call the Employee of the Future program, which is our internship to cadetship to um, graduate and so forth through the site engineer. 
but also the, the social impact. Um, and I know, and I really applaud Alison and everything Roberts has done in that regard because it's been excellent and it's about time someone brought it to light. So um, we do, um, we are very fortunate that some of the larger projects we can put dedicated people on with a social impact um, and so forth and our initiatives on projects and to sort of grow that and leave an actual tangible legacy um, in the community that you do, not just uh, you know contributing to a fund or what it might be, or media government KPI, but actually leaving a difference to, to someone through what you do. Um, I think it makes a big difference. And, and to me, that's a big part of sustainability because it all comes into you know, being future focused and, and focusing on people that are actually leaving a po positive social legacy. So um, that sounds maybe like a bit of fun, but it's actually true. And so there's some programs, I'm actually in a site shed at the moment out at Moore Park, but uh, you know, some of the programs the team's doing out here for sustainability, which we're probably going to touch on with some Aboriginal uh, employment and so forth. And it's just it means that I've seen the difference it makes to people's lives. And it's, it sort of brings tears to your eyes sometimes when you see it. And, and to see some of those direct um, impacts on what they do, I think to me that's a big part of the sustainability of what we should do as an industry. And, and again, um, you know, everything that, um, that Robert's um, do and Alison does is excellent. And companies like mine should do a lot more of it, I'll be honest. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, well, yeah, you touched on the next question. Um, so uh, recently there's been a big push within the construction industry for more Indigenous involvement. Um, so a question for both of you, how have your companies provided opportunities for this specific group of people? Um, we'll start with Alison. Um, so in all government contracts, there's a thing called APIC guidelines. So that's the Australian Participation for Indigenous... What's C stand for, Matt? APIC? Participation in construction, I think, isn't it? Construction. Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and so you have to commit, when you're tendering, you have to bid the percentage of Indigenous spend that you will have on the job. Um, I think the minimum is 1.5%, and then um, you bid what you're going to do. The trouble we have with Indigenous participation is that there is not an Indigenous phone book uh, and we struggle to, to even get people to recognise and say, hey, I'm Indigenous. Uh, and we, we recently did some Indigenous artwork on our high-vis vests and it was only when we rolled out the artwork that two of our own employees actually said, did you know I'm Indigenous? And we had no idea. Uh, so we work really closely with a company called IDIC uh, and that's owned by Adam Goods. And Adam has a company where he actually has 100 businesses underneath him. And so what they're doing is they'll do the accounts, they'll do the quoting for these businesses and um, helping them grow their business to a point where they're, at a, where they're at a point where they can fly on their own and they cut them free and they, you know, the business has then grown. And the logic behind it is to give them a hand up, not a hand out. Uh, and so we found that to be very successful on Concord Hospital um, we've doubled our percentage of APIC participation. Uh, it's not easy and you need to be completely focused on it. But as Matt said, enormously rewarding to change people's lives. And I think where we fail as a society is that we don't tell people the struggle that Indigenous people actually had. In Matt and my lifetime, when we were at school, you could actually say, I don't want that child to attend school because they're Indigenous and they could be excluded. And that happened in my lifetime, which is not something they teach you in school. So I think you need to understand why these people have been so um, persecuted and the trouble and the hardship they've had to make you realise why we need to help them. Um, and, and it's the right thing to do and it's enormously rewarding. Um, but Matt, I'd love to hear what you're doing at Stadium. Yeah, thanks, Alice. Alice. I completely agree with everything you're saying. And yeah, the, the APIC spend on, um, I've seen that move over the years as well. And, and um, like what, what you're doing, a direct partnership, I think that's, that's certainly the way to go. So, and that's why we've probably moved to some side programs based on, on the projects, because without going into it too much, I've seen the spend sort of be justified when it's not really making a difference. Um, and it's, it's um, probably won't go into that too much more. So, but you know, what, what's been impressive here, um, we've got a, a full-time um, social um, social inclusion advisor uh, who's here on the project, who have moved off another project and she's created with the team here an Aboriginal employment program. 
So we did it last year, right in the middle of COVID when there was a million challenges going on, but the job was going. So what we have an absolute obligation to the industry to do this and everything else. So basically um, we started a pre-employment program where we trained them for directly for work with some industry partners. Uh, and that was, we had a selective on this one last year, there was eight. Um, and then we worked with um, them to get a, a project. So as a direct hands-on market management uh, to get, sorry, to get a, a employment. Um, we certainly roped in our leading subcontractors and made sure they partnered with us. 100% um, of the um, Indigenous uh, participants uh, graduated. They all gained uh, uh, employment out of them. Uh, we still have four working here on the project that you see in the picture behind me at the moment. And I think the after four months, um, there's one that um, is not employed anymore, but seven out of eight, I think is, is not a bad um, strike rate. So just to me, like it's seven people, you might think that's not a lot, but geez, that's, that's seven generations, that's seven people that's, who've just helped get into the industry. And we've made sure that the companies they partner with is not just the project they commit to them for the full, full term. So it's not just, you know, if they don't have work, they, they drop them, they've got to commit. Um, and I think that's a big difference. So to me, just seeing that here and watching that, and I've, I haven't done it, the team's done it themselves. Um, it's just so rewarding um, in so many ways and, and to see them walking around the project. So that's, I think that's what um, that's what you get the most out of, to be honest, seeing that. Yeah, I think, I think Matt, just Olivia, just to put that into context, um, if you said to Matt at the start, what's the strike rate that you'd be happy with? He probably would have said one out of eight. To get seven out of eight is unbelievable. It is, it is really hard to put Indigenous workers into a construction site and it's a really hard environment. So that's amazing. Yeah, the challenge is to is not to walk away now, you know, and that's the hard bit. You know, like when this job ends, how do we, you know, so we've, we're putting the, you know, the asset on our subcontractor partnerships and so forth and that, and that's, and then the, the challenge is, can we do it on other projects? And that's yeah. even a challenge in the business itself to get other projects in our own business to do that. So it's really hard and you need to have the resources to do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's really good to hear those initiatives. Um, I think the construction industry is just starting to get a handle of it, but to go further, that would be amazing. And it sounds like both companies are doing really well. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, Matt is the GM for New South Wales and ACT. Um, and Alison, uh, you also had previous experience in a, the same role at Len Lease, I believe. Um, so I'll aim this question towards Matt at first, but if Alison wants to join in, all good. Um, so what was a project that you completed well and uh, what like went well about it or if there were challenges or whatever? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, look, I'll give, without naming the project, look, I've had lots of different experiences and projects coming into the organisation I'm in now, but we've, we've reset a lot, which is good. Um, I was probably had a, a bit on a platter for 25 years in my previous company. Um, but look, I think a recent one that we completed, when I started here, um, we'd recently signed a contract for a project down in Western Sydney. And, um, you know, coming on to the project, seeing it start, um, I could see straight away it was not starting well. This is within a few weeks of me being here and we had the wrong people, absolutely the wrong people on the project. Um, there was all sorts of things. So, um, you know, obviously um, got quite involved, um, got very close with the client and I basically changed the team out. It sounds pretty harsh. Um, didn't think I was be doing that straight away. But, but when I had to, I put the right people in. It's all about the people and the skill sets and, and everything that goes with it. Um, as I was mentioned before about design management. So, so in doing that, we did reset the team uh, very early and made the right decision very early on. Um, we put the right design managers, the right cost planners, uh, the right people on the ground, the right supervisors, um, restructured the team. Um, and basically, you know, that, that project finished three months ahead at the end of the day. And we had a contract where it was without getting into it too much, it was called a, a, a cap sort of GMP where we had a share of savings and every every sort of week we finished ahead, we got a greater percentage of the savings. And so we ended up achieving 50% of the savings and and while we were losing, to be straight with you, on the job the first six months, um, we managed to recorrect it um, and came out with a, with a nice margin on the project. So, so that's a good story, <laughs> but that's all about making the right decisions and the right people and, and getting the right team in place. Yeah, that turnaround's really impressive. 
Um, and so a lot of the attendees, or not a lot, but some of them would probably end up in positions similar to yours. Um, what would be your biggest tip or reason for going into the role? Is that to me? Uh, yeah, to Matt. <laughs> uh, the biggest reason, look, I, I suppose, I mean, I didn't set out to, to get where I am. I, th I think, um, especially if you get to a certain age, you, you sort of want to make sure you, you're doing what you're happy doing. Um, so, um, you know, I... I I used to set sort of goals and five and 10 year goals. And I'll be honest, I used to write them down and open a bit of paper 10 years later and say, have I got it and tick them off and be quite methodical about it. Um, that, that's to be on the service since probably the last four or five years. That's out the window now. And I quite enjoy just trusting myself and making sure I wake up happy. Uh, that's really hard to do every day. Um, but that's the main reason um, sort of why I'm here. And that's why, you know, like ours, and I, I think the things that we do, you know, put, I talked about growth and profit, put that all aside. The, the good things about the work is, is seeing the, the difference you can make to people's lives and, and that makes a big difference. So that's, that's what I like about the role and probably why I'm here now and who knows where I'll be in five years' time. So. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, do you have anything to add, Alison? Yeah, no, I think just for the students, um, you know, when, you, when you're young and looking up and thinking, how do I get there? Um, I know when I started in industry, I wanted to be a construction manager which is, uh, you know, on every project you have a project manager that runs that particular project and a construction manager sat across two or three jobs and I thought that would be an awesome role if I could just have that. Um, and I went past that pretty quickly. I've never asked for a role in my life. People think I'm really career focused because I've got to a senior level. I'm not. I've taken every opportunity that's been given to me. I haven't asked for a promotion once. I've turned down a promotion along the way. I've just taken every opportunity that's been given to me and I've run really hard and I've made the most of it and um, I do my work to the best of my ability. Now, when you're young, um, you need to trust that when we look down through teams, we can see really clearly and really quickly who's good and who's bad. You know, Matt saw something very quickly in a project team and when I think about a job that I've seen that's gone bad was we had the wrong team. And there's one thing we, we both know, um, it's not like red wine. It does not get better with age. It, it's um, And so often you're hesitant to make the change because you think, oh, I've just got a few more months. If I can just crawl to the end, it'll be okay and I'll fix it up on the next job. But you've just got to make the call early. And it's not necessarily that those people are wrong or those people don't know. They're in the wrong environment. So sometimes, yes, they're wrong and you need to exit them out of the business. But sometimes you just push them beyond their ability or you've got a personality clash, personality clashes happen, that's life. You know, you're not gonna get on with everyone in the team um, and you've got to change it and set people up for the future. So um, if I can instill anything in you, please trust that the people above you will see that you're good and will pull you up. Uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to see who's performing and who's not when we look down. Yeah, that's awesome. very inspiring. Um, so I just will go on to a few questions about uh, more women empowerment and things like that. Um, so Alison was actually the Langer Rocks Businesswoman of the Year Award um, in 2018. Uh, so I'll ask it for, towards Alison first. Um, what was the industry like when you first started out in terms of women's involvement in the industry? <laughs> I actually have, on the weekend, I actually wrote a, an article um, for NOAA Journal on 25 years in construction, and Matt will relate to a lot of this. Um, when I started in construction, I didn't have a toilet on our best site office, and I had to leave the site office, leave the site, and I had to go around the corner past two office buildings to get to the toilet. And I remember saying to them, why did you build a boy's toilet and not a girl's toilet? And they were like, oh, no, we could only build one. And I was like, oh, okay. And I accepted it. Now I am a toilet Nazi and I inspect toilets wherever I go to make sure no one ever has to ask for a basic human right again. Um, so I was the only girl. Um, there was porn in the lunchroom. There was porn in the toolboxes. Um, and I'm talking like penthouse, full on porn. And they'd open the toolbox as I walked past. Um, there was wolf whistles. It wasn't a compliment. They were just given to any girl on the site. Um, when, you know, we didn't have iPads, we didn't have iPhones, we didn't have email. Uh, when I started in the industry, we were on MS-DOS. We were on 
a system that was before Windows. Uh, there were no mobile phones. So if you needed to make a phone call, you had to come back to the office. Or if you're on a tower, you actually carried the handpiece of a phone with a cord and you could plug it into the phone system on site to make a phone call. Um, you know, if you wanted to make, if you wanted to take a photo, you had to take the site camera and take the photos. And then if you needed them quickly, you'd go to the chemist and ask for the one hour film development. Um, but there was something really, really addictive about it. It was hard, it was work hard, it was play harder. Um, and the big thing for me was it was such a team environment and it was fun. You know, if you had an office in a side office and you were a senior person and you got an office, it was at your peril to go on holidays because when you came back, the practical jokes would have been on your office. You know, they might have plasterboarded it over your door. They've, I've seen furniture stuck to roofs. I've seen boys' offices painted hot pink. Um, so much fun, politically incorrect, but enormous fun. And I think as an industry, we've lost a bit of that fun and we've come to politically correct. Uh, but for me, the feeling of team on a construction site is so addictive. If you could bottle it and sell it, you would be worth more than a drug dealer. And I think that's why... Matt and I stay in the industry as long as we have and why um, you do work hard and you do do the five, six or seven days a week at the end of a job. It's really addictive and you want to be there. Um, it's an amazing environment. Yeah, well, yeah. what a story. <laughs> um, so the next question uh, for both uh, interviewees is how do both your companies ensure that women are properly represented within the company? Um, particularly in executive roles. Uh, so maybe we'll start with Matt this time. Yeah, no, thanks. That's um, it's a really good question for a large company like ours and because we have different, um, well, we're all one company, just a, a little bit of structure. There's sort of separate business units um, and we're quite different in diversity. I look to be completely frank with everyone, uh, especially in senior management roles. So we're quite fortunate while I'm building, we're very flat structured, there's not a lot of it. Um, like on my direct team, there's seven of us and, and four are female. There's one traditional, what you call a traditional um, female role, which is a wrong thing to say, um, but um, there's all, the other three are not and they're senior leaders and they're probably my top performers, um, absolutely. So, but going across the business, I think um, the business has a lot more to, can, they can do. If you look at our board, which um, we don't have a lot to do with. Um, there's no females on the board, and I'm going to call that out. If whoever's listening, I'm happy to call that out all the time. We've already spoken about CEO about it, and also, uh, but in the exec, there is a number of uh, leading females, such as our chief strategy and, and people officer, which who are excellent. So what they are doing now, and, in, and just an interesting um, thing that the company did in the last few months. So we, they have a large graduate program. And we've had a lot of um, training and it's been very rewarding on a conscious bias. And I went through it myself several weeks ago. And while I think I'm quite there and I know what I'm doing, I, I was found out even myself about some unconscious bias he had. And that's across all types of diversity, right? Not just females. Um, but what, what they actually did in the last year's graduate intake, um, we had uh, what wasn't advertised, we forced a 50% female intake across the board, but what they did with the um, CVs is all the names got taken off and all the, um, anything to do with any type of diversity, whether it be your sex or where you're from or anything like that was taken off. And we sent it to the recruitment team to see what came out at the end and actually came out 50-50, <laughs> believe it or not. So surprise, um, surprise, <laughs> you know, um, it, um, where it wasn't in the, in the years gone, gone past. And so um, so everyone you know, talks about quotas and when to put quotas, and I think absolutely there's a need. Um, and our interns and undergrads at the moment, I make sure we're at least 50%. And we have so many applications. It's, it's easy to pick um, high quality candidates across the board. So I can't see why we can't do it across the company. Um, but it's a, it's a long process and it's going to take a, a bit of time. But when I started, um, I think it was in, in 95, I was in first year at the Broadway building there on Harris Street. Alison, uh, there was two females in our course. And most, we'd just been through a recession and most people were full-time, I was part-time. But I think going back to um, doing a few lectures and things like that, I've been quite encouraged by the diversity that's there now. So I'm quite optimistic about the future. Um, but I still think businesses like ours have a lot, a long way to go um, in the senior management roles. Yeah, well, it's it's good to hear you're getting to start at a graduate level, though. Yep. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the audience would be glad to hear that. 
um, as some of them are going for those type of roles at the moment. Um, so we'll just go over to Alison uh, for, for the same question. So um, in our company, we are 60, 40 female, male in my team at exec level. We are 35% female by staff and we are 29% 20, female when I bring in all of our construction workers. Uh, where traditionally it's very hard to get um, females in crane drivers, hoist drivers, um, a, a carpenter um, and your cleaners and that sort of stuff, traffic controllers. So you normally don't get many in that area. Uh, so we're 29% through the whole company. Um, what I am going to say to the women on the line is women are really hard to employ. And I say that because women underrate themselves. If a guy has four, if a guy has four out of 10 elements, they say, wow, I'm proficient. Yep, I can do that job. If a girl has nine out of 10, they say, I don't have 10%, I, I, I can't do this job. Now, if you are fully proficient for everything you are applying for, you are overskilled for the job. You should always have stretch in your job. And women also have enormous loyalty to companies where they are. So it takes a lot more talking for us to bring women into the business. And quite interesting, when we do reference checks on women, we do reference checks on everyone. When we do reference checks on women, it's really interesting that a lot of them come back and they go, mm, she cried a lot or she was difficult or she had this issue. And what you've got to try and differentiate is, was it the female or was it the environment that she was in? Because all of the women that we've employed in the organisation have blossomed like a flower and they have been beautiful to watch. When you put them in a really safe, caring, supportive environment, women will shine. And so what I want to say to the women is if you get offered a role and you say, I only got offered it because I was a female, you don't ever say that. You say yes and you take it. Because I can guarantee you when a guy gets offered a role through a rugby mate, he doesn't go, I only got offered it because I play rugby with the guy. He says yes. Now, when I was at Lend Lease, um, the organisation, if you sliced it vertically, was 32%. And the CEO at the time, to his absolute credit, said, for every internal function, I want 32% attendees to be female. So I got invited to everything. And my fellow GMs would get the shits and say, well, you only got invited because you're a girl. And I'm like, yep, maybe, but I'm there. I'm going, I'm networking, I'm hearing the message firsthand. So please don't undersell yourself and please don't say I only got invited because I'm a female. It doesn't matter. A company will not put you in a position where you can fail or destroy a company to meet a quota or meet a target. Um, and, and what we are seeing is when you walk into our office, having 30%, um, 35% of the company is females of our staff, you can't tell we're a construction company. There's not swearing and cursing. There's not yelling. There's not screaming. Um, we've just come across as a really professional organisation. And... We are, you know, Matt said earlier about leaving a legacy for communities you operate in. The community that you are um, operating in is very diverse. So if, if I said to Matt, can you design a breastfeeding room in a retail shopping centre? His answer, he'd have a go, but he wouldn't understand. I didn't understand until I had a child. Now I have had a child and I've used nursing rooms. I know what's needed in there. So unless you have people with all the skills and life experiences and... Um, you know, designing a mosque. I've not been in a mosque. I don't know what you do in a mosque. So I couldn't design it for the community. So that's why you need the diversity and that's why you need everyone to think differently, to solve the problems, to be the best they can be. Um, sorry, that's a really long answer because I'm very passionate about it. Oh, good. Oh, very empowering though. Um, and I'm Sorry, yeah. can I make one more question? Yes. Um, I... I for, for women in the industry, and when you look at the Wajia stats, and the Wajia stats are the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. Um, when you have over 100 employees, you have to report to Wajia on your female participation. And they have a pay gap uh, calculator, and it'll tell you that the pay gap is 26.4% in construction. Can you not focus on it, and can you just ignore it? Because the pay gap is a formula that is average female salary minus average man salary divided by average man salary. It is not that you have like for like pay. Now, John Holland has been very, very vocal to say we have pay equality. So their site engineers, male and female, earn the same. Their project engineers, male or female, earn the same. 
but we all have pay gaps according to WGIA. And the reason we have that is because contractors are bringing women in at 50-50 at graduate level. When you employ 50-50 at graduate level, you're suddenly bringing in a big female cohort at the bottom salary. So that pulls down your average female salary. So I just wanna to say to everyone, ignore it. What you wanna ask is you've got pay equality in like for like roles. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, thank you for adding that. Um, just another question for you as well, uh, just a quick one. So recently you changed the working construction days for some of your projects from uh, six to five. Um, what motivated you to make such a big impact on your projects and how has this positively influenced um, the individuals in your company and the community? Um, so the reason we did it is a construction worker is six times more likely to die from suicide than a workplace accident. We have very high divorce rates and we have very high presentees and where everyone stays late and doesn't feel like they can go home. Um, and that's an unsustainable industry. So what we said was, let's work five days a week, Monday to Friday. Let's not work weekends. And everyone knows I like to water ski on weekends. So um, let's give people back their weekends. When you work Monday to Friday only, you give your construction workers six weeks additional rest per annum. And yes, it's not in one block, but it is um, uh, every weekend you're doubling their rest uh, the rest that they've got. How good do you feel after a long weekend? Think of that every weekend. For every eight years that they work on a construction project, they get an entire year of time back with their family. So we have, in the 80s and early 90s, we were a five day a week industry and it was when interest rates went to 17%. The builders put the extra day back in the program to lower the overall cost of the job so that interest rates weren't, interest costs weren't as high. But we are very much an industry when we give an inch, we, it, it never recalibrates and it's gone. And if I asked anyone on this call as young people who wants to work Saturdays, I dare say all of you would say no. Now, what we're seeing at Concord is that we are getting um, increased productivity by working Monday to Friday. So the subcontractors are now starting to drive the program and um, they know that if they finish, they get Saturdays and Sundays off. And what we're trying to combat is giving people back their lives. If I give you more rest, I'll get better quality, I'll get better safety. If I give people back their weekends, I can attract more women into construction and I can attract more women in construction through their childbearing years or single parents. There is no daycare on a Saturday. So if you are a single parent, what do you do? And what we've engaged the University of New South Wales to study it. They've studied 166 construction workers to date and 12 next of kin. And the feedback that's come out has been really interesting. We just got the interim report last week that working five days a week actually has impacted, their pos impacted positively their relationship with the site manager, their relationship with their peers, their relationship with other workers, um, their, their work-life balance, their pay, um, in 10 different elements, it's had a positive influence on them, much more than I thought it would. I thought we would have just affected work-life balance. Um, so what we're trying to do is take away the mental health issues, give people back their lives, but keep productivity up. Uh, and the feedback from the subcontractors, 82.5% of the 166 people have said, um, we prefer five days a week. As yeah. The delivery method. yeah, well, it's seemed to make a big impact, especially on people's well-being. And uh, I have to say, I have the theory that um, it will it will be a five day a week industry when everyone on this call is in my position. So why wait ten years for you to get there when I'm long retired versus bring it in now? And Matt and I can enjoy it. <laughs> well, hopefully that's where the industry is heading. Um, it's really good to hear. Um, we just have one final question for Matt. Um, so just generally, where do you feel the industry is heading and how should uh, the audience adapt? Very big question. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, a lot, it's changed a lot. It's interesting hearing what Alison went through. have been through 25 years ago. I can remember so many things there. And um, the industry has changed, but in some sense it still hasn't. You know, so as far as looking forward and where it's going, I would just tell everyone to keep on challenging 
um, those of them, no matter what company they're from or where they're from, where they're from, and challenging the the red tape and the processes and things that go, because you can certainly change it, and I've I've seen that. Um, hopefully, it's heading that we're finally uh, getting more digitised. Um, and, and I know Alison touched on the technology. We've been so slow to adapt across the board, um, and, and some things. While we've now I've moved from Lotus Notes to something else, you know, in 25 years. Um, some things certainly haven't changed. So hopefully that's certainly going uh, in the right way. We're yeah. likely to be, a, you know, we're talking about, especially about the uh, five day um, week, be good to get, um, I've seen um, the good and the bad of the large infrastructure projects where a lot of, in, we do employ pure engineers that work on, and a lot of you will probably be interested in that. Even with the budget announcement the last um, 24 hours, you'll see there's another record spending for infrastructure. And I just look at that and thought, wow, um, the discussions on risk profile, where they're heading, uh, burning people out is just going to get greater and need to get greater so quick. So while it's, it's sort of a little bit easier um, in my little role here in New South Wales and building, but the larger mega projects, I've seen people get burned out so quick. And I've had personal close friends of mine, you know, not tell me um, until two years later, they had a massive drinking problem uh, and so forth and, and nearly be the end of them. Um, so I'm hoping and optimistic that that will certainly change. But exactly as Alison said, we need all of you to keep pushing and pushing people like me to change it. So I'm optimistic that's sorry, it's a bit of a long-winded and roundabout answer, but that's where I really hope it's, it's going to change and, and um, we can all do it for the right reasons. Yeah, for sure. Well, we all have a part to play. Um, so that wraps up the interview part. Um, I'll hand over to Sophia for a bit of a speedy Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olivia. It's going to be a bit of a speedy Q&A. And we had a few questions come through the chat as well as some from our sponsors. Um, the first question I wanted to ask was actually directed to the both of you. And this was asked by Adria. Now, uh, both of you talked about the importance of um, people and teams and collaboration. So what we were curious about or what Adria was curious about was how do you know if the people in your team are the right people and what traits should we aim to have to be like the right people as you both coined um Matt do you want to start off yeah yeah it's um you, you get better at that with experience but it still comes down to you know, being a you know the, the right people is for me is um a range of things but it's it's not being um the right culture it's being you know i like people to roll their sleeves up and not be so siloed at what they do i you know expect people to be able to be versatile and i think it's good and i expect myself that i've got to be versatile as well um so especially when you're starting off and, and in um, your career getting involved in as much as you can in completely different things is the right thing to do um look where i've seen um you know, people not be right. It stands out, as Alison said. We we know we can see it a mile away. And I think if you're, you know, a good person, you have the right ethical values. Um, you'll listen to people. Um, you acknowledge people. Um, you learn from other people. Um, that will go a long way. Because learning, you know, I, I remember every single foreman I used to work for, every single site manager, every single. GM of a subcontractor I used to report to uh, dealing with others and I still deal with those people 25 plus years later and that's what makes the difference. Um, yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you so much for that. I think that um, wanting to learn as well as the versatility is such an interesting point, especially because in university we're kind of like, you know, taught to do things one way, that's the only way. But I guess when you get to industry things, you need a bit more flexibility. Um, Alison, what are your thoughts? Um, look, I agree with what Matt said, and we employ for culture. We can teach you technical. I can't teach you culture. If you're an ass, you're an ass, and I can't change you. Um, and that's why we've got the no dickheads policy. Uh, so what we look for is people who, as Matt said, versatile, um, you know, happy to roll their sleeves up, ask questions, but don't just get to a problem and ask someone what the solution is. Have a crack at solving it yourself. And then when you get to a point, say, okay, look, I've done this. Um, I'm stuck. I need help at this point. So it's, um, yeah, look, it's just getting in and having a go and having a great attitude, a great attitude that you want to learn, be a sponge. Everyone knows you come out of uni and I know you all think you know everything. I tell you, you know nothing when you come out of uni. 
Um, I know I didn't know what a window mullion was when I came out of uni and I had to look it up in the paper dictionary when I got home because Google didn't wasn't invented. Um, so it's just having that inquisitive mind, I think, is, is will serve you well. No, thank you so much for that. I think, um, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm a fourth year, I still don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how much I know, so... <laughs> Um, um, so, people, so one thing I, one thing I um, remind students and graduates and undergraduates is always look back where you were six months ago or 12 months ago. You find you know so much more. I used to do that when I was a project manager on a job and I used to get flattened by, geez, we're not going anywhere. I'd open the file up and look at the photos four weeks ago. Yes, we have actually done something, you know, to, to remind yourself because when you're in it, you don't see it. Yeah. One thing... One, one thing um, one bit of advice I clearly remember from someone who's now since retired said, um, I actually went to my first client meeting. I was at a job. I was scared like nothing else. I was sitting there, hands down, like I was at an auction, didn't know what I was doing. I was still at university. And um, he walked out and said, Matt, you didn't ask any questions. I said, I was just sort of froze. And he said, I guarantee you, everything you didn't know in that meeting, there was one or two other people that didn't also know, but they just won't say it. And that's mm. so true. So always ask the question. Yeah. yeah that's very reassuring but also quite inspiring especially I think a lot of us sometimes even in class environments where we don't know something and we're scared to put our hands up and ask and the reality is like we think we're the only ones but there's probably at least like five or six or ten or twenty or fifty people have the exact same predicament um yeah thank you both so much I wish I could ask you more questions but we're reaching 6 p.m so I'm going to have to wrap things up today um, thank you everyone so much for coming to this, this series and this talk. It's been really wonderful seeing you all and reading all your questions. Thank, um, thank you so much to our reps, um, Alison and Matt, for speaking and attending. Um, your insight has been really, really valuable. And hopefully we'll see everyone at some future CIS events. Thank you for having us. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, also, uh, yeah, so also um, make sure you watch all the uh, recordings by the end of Sunday, 23rd of May, um, to make sure you get the PEP hours. Um, and there's a feedback form uh, for the end of the entire series, so make sure you complete that and look out on Facebook for it. Um, but yeah, so this concludes it. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a good night.